Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We are on day 21 of Vladimir Putin's war on Ukraine, and we are very lucky today to be joined by Susan Glasser, staff writer at The New Yorker and CNN Global Affairs Analyst. Uh, Susan, th- thank you for coming back on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, let me give you the backstory. So um, about a week ago, my wife and I are watching uh, Amanpour and uh, your interview on that program, which was about, uh, it was a very extensive in-depth interview. And I said to my wife, I said, I have to get her back on the podcast. But, <laughs> but I'm also thinking she's going to be so busy. So, I mean, just for people's background here, uh, Susan's a former Moscow co-bureau chief for the Washington Post and co-author of the book Kremlin Rising, Vladimir Putin's Russia and the End of Revolution. And more recently was, of course, uh, the co-author of The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of Jim Baker. So, Susan, you know, you, you obviously have a great depth of knowledge about all of the things that are going on. So I was wondering, when you get up in the morning, like this morning, what was the question you had in your mind? What were you thinking about, about this story? You know, thank you so much, first of all, for for having me back and, you know, for paying attention to this and for caring. As you said, it's, it's been 20 years, more than 20 years of watching Putin and this sort of horrible slow motion crash of all of our assumptions and, and 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 yet the denial that that went on for so long and then right war just rips that off but yeah i mean i'm sure like a lot of people i've had a terrible time sleeping for the last 3 weeks because you wake up certainly you know the first couple of weeks right you wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and is kiev still standing right uh, what horrible thing has happened overnight the other night i woke up in the middle of the night, and it just random names of Ukrainian cities were just popping into my head. You know, Mariupol and Kherson and Odessa and Kharkiv. And, you know, it just, um, because of the unique nature also of this, this social media moment, the way in which we're viscerally experiencing the war thousands of miles from the front line, the information war is a front line, and we're all sort of living in it. And so, you know, it's, it's just, it's truly traumatic. And these are places, by the way, that I've been to, that I know and love. Kiev is one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. It's a historic city. And while Putin is already attacking it, uh, you know, I truly fear that we haven't yet begun to plumb the depths of destruction mm. that are going to happen to that beautiful place. I heard you say that on CNN this morning, and I want to double back on that because just the the thought of Russians bombing Kiev, which is the mother of Russian cities, the the birthplace of Russian Christianity. Uh, it is not just one other city; it has such an incredible role in Russian history. And to just to think about the significance of Russians destroying that city, it is extraordinary. And so I want to double back on that. But let's start on a somewhat more hopeful note. Your thoughts about that extraordinary incident yesterday where a woman named, and I apologize in advance if I if, if I botch her name, Marina uh, Avsanakova, uh, who works for state TV news, makes an appearance during a state TV broadcast. I mean, this is the uh, the flagship evening news program chanting, stop the war, denouncing government propaganda. And she's holding up a sign, stop the war, don't believe propaganda. They're lying to you. And she'd apparently also, well, not apparently, she had also uh, recorded a video before this appearance, because I think she realized she might not be available afterwards, talking about um, why she did it. You know, what is happening now in Ukraine is criminal. Russia is the aggressor and the responsibility for this aggression lies on the conscience of one person, uh, Vladimir Putin. And then she ends by saying they can't imprison us all. So, Susan, give me your sense of that that kind of, of, of moment, what's going on in Russia, that someone would be willing to put their, obviously their career and perhaps their, you know, the next 20 years, 15, 20 years of their lives on the line to make that statement. Yeah, well, unfortunately, they can't imprison all of them, but they can and they have and they will imprison her and they've just imposed this really draconian new criminal law in which actually even just saying that war is war 
is enough to get you convicted under it. They literally are not allowing Russian media to say that there's a war in Ukraine. It has to be referred to only as a special military operation. And so you have this almost Orwellian echo of, you know, the worst excesses of 20th century totalitarianism in terms of speech and thought control. And, uh, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners have also seen pictures in recent days of individual protesters literally being dragged to jail while holding up blank signs. Uh, I saw a photograph today of a woman who was dragged away the, by the police by holding up a sign in front of a cathedral that said simply, thou shalt not kill. Mm. So it's now illegal in Russia to hold up a sign that says, thou shalt not kill, uh, to hold up a blank piece of paper. So that puts the context of this incredibly brave act to you know, take on Russia's most watched propaganda evening news show and uh, puncture that bubble. You know, this is really uh, a serious crime against uh, the, the thought police nature of what Putin's dictatorship has morphed into. And they are likely to put her away, you know, a la Navalny for a very, very long time. And so it's an act of extraordinary bravery. But, you know, I hate being kind of the, the Cassandra these days, Charlie, but I, I don't want people to get a false sense of optimism right. or that, you know, Russia is on the verge of revolution and and toppling Vladimir Putin. Uh, you know, while it's true that opinion polls aren't to be trusted uh, in Russia, especially after, you know, literally decades of propaganda, the bottom line is that uh, Russia is not in a revolutionary or even pre-revolutionary state as far as anyone can tell. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it, it's a country of many, many millions of people spread across almost a dozen time zones, and there have been a few thousand arrests, let's say 10,000, and that's being probably generous across the country. In a country of millions and millions of people, it shows you two things. One, the incredible ferocity of the authorities and the fact that it's it's such an enormous risk. Uh, but two, uh, what's happening instead of people really rising up is that you're seeing this remarkable fast exodus of essentially what remained of liberal mm -hmm. Russia. And those people are leaving the country. They're not staying there to fight a revolution against Vladimir Putin. They're leaving the country. Uh, the sort of uh, professional upper middle class in cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, they, they're, this is a tragedy, of course, for them of a different nature than the horrible violence unleashed in their name in Ukraine. But it's making in some ways less likely that that Putin will be toppled from some popular uprising because yeah. the people who would lead that are leaving the country. I think this is an important point because even though there's been a lot of talk about how you know, Putin is losing the social media war, the reality is, and this is kind of a hard truth, is that he's won the propaganda war within Russia, hasn't he? I mean, I saw an interview with a Russian journalist who I think had gone to Georgia to escape some of this new repression. And he said that he was surprised by how effective uh, the Russian propaganda had been, that years and years and years of conditioning people had an effect and that the majority of Russians, he was, he had made the same point you made. He said the majority of Russians uh, either don't know what's going on or are supportive of it. We shouldn't be in denial about that. No, I think that's right. We shouldn't. And, and again, I mean, look, this is a war being waged by Putin in the name of the Russian people. It certainly wasn't a popular war that was demanded by the people of Putin, right? You know, I do think that in the privacy of their kitchens, many Russians, just like like people the world over, don't want to massacre their neighbors and, you know, send their sons off to the army to die in a foreign land. So the problem is, is that there is a lived recent memory of decades of Soviet dictatorship and that ingrained fear in a population. And I saw it even living there two decades ago. People retreat back to their inner circle of trust, saying only what they think at the kitchen table with their loved ones. And their survival instincts are going to kick in for how to survive a dictatorship that, frankly, in the last few weeks, under the pretext and the cover of war, this is something I was warning about before the invasion. And it was really hard for people to focus on. There is an interconnection directly between 
the war of aggression against Russia's neighbor and a huge new wave of domestic repression mm -hmm. and crackdown inside of Russia. These are not separate phenomenon. And by the way, the war did not cause the domestic repression. It now accelerates something that Putin has already been doing. And so this, this new Iron Curtain, this new phase of, you know, Russia's sort of North Korea turn uh, you know, this is not an unwelcome side effect of the war for Vladimir Putin, but a positive consequence as he sees it. This is an important point. And I, and I actually did want to start here because we need to focus on, of course, what's happening in Ukraine. But the point you're making is that uh, r what's happening in Russia is also really significant, especially when you consider how Russia had been. The modern Russia was not Stalin's Russia. Uh, it, it, it had become much more. Uh, integrated into the world economy, into Europe. Uh, there was a liberal cosmopolitan culture in some of the big cities. And so, you know, that is under siege, if not, you know, in the process of, of being destroyed. Yeah, basically 30 years of integration with the West and with the world has, has been blown up in the last few weeks by Vladimir Putin, by the way, not by the West, by Vladimir Putin. Uh, he, he made a choice to do this. And it's not like, I think he seems perhaps surprised at, uh, you know, the lack of immediate success of his military campaign, but I, I don't think he's surprised at the the sanctions. Uh, you know, he knew really? this was coming and it's, it's, it's a terrible tragedy. You know, Russia has had these cycles of history, not just for a few decades, but, you know, for a few hundred years, these waves of, uh, brief moments of opening and uh, looking out to the rest of the world and modernization, and then periods of intense crackdown, mm -hmm. inward looking dictatorship. And so, you know, this is, this is a part of a long cycle of Russian history and this, this conflict between the Russophiles in Russian history, those who have this notion of a special destiny for Eurasia and for Russia versus those who see Russia as essentially a more normal European country or, you know, at least aspire to that. When I was there, it was only a decade after the fall of the Soviet Union when we arrived. And, you know, that was the desire that I heard articulated by so many people. And that's, of course, part of the tragedy of Putin and Putinism is that there was hope then for Russia to be what people call, I would just want to live in a normal Mm -hmm. stable country. And that's what they wanted. And, you know, Europe was, was the goal. Uh, it's so amazing to see Putin going to war to stop Ukraine from pursuing a European destiny for itself. When I lived in Russia, it was Russia itself uh, that contemplated uh, a European future and where uh, people look toward. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's really a tragedy. Uh, and now many people are authors of that tragedy, including the passivity of the Russian people. And that's something as we think about democracy here in the United States, I think about a lot. Uh, you know, there are many steps along the way. Uh, there's an old Russian saying, the appetite grows while eating. Vladimir Putin in 2003 wasn't capable of doing what he's doing today. Uh, his power grew in part because the Russian people let him have his power grow. You know, you're talking about these these cycles of Russian history, and, and this is really interesting to me because I stayed up late last night rereading uh, Robert Massey's Peter the Great, where he, mm -hmm. and, and clearly you see these cycles of inward looking and how hard it was to open Russia to the rest of the world. But uh, is, is there is there also a the kind of uh, urban rural divide in Russia? that we have in this country, because we, we were talking before about the cosmopolitan, liberal, European, Western-looking urban population. Where does the more Russophile impulse come from? Does that come from the rest of the country? Is is there, well, is, is there that mean, kind of a divide? You know what I mean. So there, there is absolutely in terms of geography and the distribution, if anything, it's much more pronounced. Uh, you know, Russia uh, has a few very uh, uh, developed modern centers uh, and, you know, cultural power as well as economic power completely almost focused on the west of the Urals part of Russia. And it's a vast, sprawling and in many places largely empty country. But political power, 
there's a real danger in laying on our American notions about the distribution of political power and geography because Russia has always had an extraordinarily centralized system. Mm. And, you know, the real issue in Russia is not, oh, well, there's a sort of people power in the, you know, the farmers in Siberia, because really the problem with Russia is this tradition of despotism Mm -hmm. and the people have no power in Putin's conception of the world. Now they may be invoked by Russian leaders, uh, but um, unfortunately he comes from a despotic tradition and it predates uh, the Soviet despots. In fact, a young Vladimir Putin, I, I wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs a, a few years ago, a, a kind of a, a portrait of, of Putin after two decades when he became the longest serving leader of Russia since Joseph Stalin. And I, I, th- I find it really notable that, you know, he is a product of St. Petersburg, mm-hmm. Peter the Great City. And he, as a young deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, in the immediate post-Soviet collapse, you know, he was probably still a you know, undercover KGB agent of some kind, he hung on his wall a portrait of Peter the Great. Uh, and, you know, th- there's almost a nostalgia and a project of restoring the pre-Soviet Russian empire that is a part of Putin's rhetoric. If you read his sort of bastardized history version of why he thinks Russia and Ukraine are really one country, uh, which was clearly laying out the pretext for this invasion, came out last summer, I, I recommend it. Uh, but what you'll also see is that it's almost this imperial rhetoric that he's offering as as justification for his devastation. And it's not about the people at all. In fact, mm. you know, the the idea of the Gasudarsva, the state, is all powerful. And it's not a concept, that word that in Russian, it doesn't even include the people. It's not about the the compact between governed and governing. The state has its own interests as as conceived of in Russia. So you have studied Vladimir Putin for decades now. And one of the big questions is, is has he changed? Is there something that is different with the Vladimir Putin that has made this decision? Or is there the through line of the younger Vladimir Putin who had Peter the Great's picture up on the wall? What do you think? You know, I, I think Obviously, it's very hard to get into someone's head, especially someone who comes from such a different perspective. What we can say, I think, is that there are clear echoes of uh, the sort of hard-edged, militaristic nationalism, security state methods and techniques uh, that carried Vladimir Putin all the way through this very unlikely career uh, uh, to become Russia's new dictator. And so, you know, I don't, it's not like, I know there's the temptation, especially when someone undertakes an action as, as terrible, uh, as launching this kind of a war against your neighbor, a war of aggression. But I don't think Vladimir Putin just woke up one morning and went crazy. Uh, you know, it's yeah. not like, you know, he's sort of having a psychotic episode and he'll just snap out of it. You know, he, this Vladimir Putin has learned over more than two decades in power that from his perspective, the use of military force has succeeded for him. He's done it multiple times. So it's not like this is the first war that he's launched. Uh, In fact, he came to power by launching a war in Chechnya and it was a brutal war. And uh, what they undertook in Grozny, uh, uh, you know, is a very, very chilling foreshadowing of what I fear could await for Ukraine cities. You know, he then went to war against his neighbor, Georgia. He went to war in Syria to back up uh, the Assad regime of murderers and dictators and users of chemical weapons against civilians. So, you know, there is a continuity here uh, that makes it hard to just say, well, you know, two years of COVID isolation have made Putin, you know, nuts. It does seem uh, to be, I would say, a much riskier assault than he has undertaken before. And it's, you know, certainly perhaps the quality of advice that he's getting or his willingness to take in information uh, seems to have declined. You see the visual of him sitting by himself at that long table, right? And you understand this is a, a dictator in isolation. 
Uh, and he, he did seem to have really misinformed assumptions that underpinned the nature of the military campaign plan that he authorized for Ukraine. And his appetite has grown as he's eaten more. And going yes. back to that to that adage, because, uh, you know, we, we talk about the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, well, he invaded Ukraine earlier when he took Crimea. So this is not the this is not the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine. This is a continuation. And he's gotten away with it. Um, exactly. I, I, admit, I think a lot of uh, Americans are probably somewhat chagrined to you know read about the fact that and then, and then he attacked Georgia and then he went into Ukraine and he used chemical weapons in Syria and he got away with it. He actually used unconventional chemical weapons on the streets of London and got yes. away with it going twice. after him twice. Uh, so there are reasons for him to think that he would be able to get away with this as well. So I like dive into this question of, of what he thought would happen, what his view of the West was. Clearly, he thought that, the, well, you tell me whether I'm right or wrong, that he saw weakness. He saw that the United States was weak and divided. He, he thought that uh, Europe was uh, was also weak and divided. And he had reason to think so, given given the past, lack of response, lack of resolve in pushing back on things that he'd done before. So do you agree with that or to expand on why what he thought the United States and Europe might do and why he thought he'd get away with this again. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Charlie, that Putin has a deeply cynical view of human nature uh, and the West has given him ample confirmation of those views in recent years. And, uh, you know, he has uh, used military power before, done things that were perceived uh, or that we said were unacceptable, and then somehow we accepted them uh, and reintegrated Russia after its initial invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Within a few years, was not only uh, 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 intervening in the U.S. election, but was hosting the Soccer World Cup. Uh, and yeah. people were partying on the streets of Moscow. Uh, and so, you know, the consequences, there were sanctions that were never lifted. And it turned out they didn't destroy at that time the Russian economy. Uh, and, you know, he and his friends were able to uh, fly around in their jets and to purchase super yachts, which we're now seeing the grotesqueness of uh, you know, this Russian elite and their, how they spent money and what they used it on, uh, you know, they, they chose to send their wives and mistresses, uh, and second families, uh, to their apartments in London and New York and, uh, you know, spending the summer in Italy. And so, you know, they felt that the West, uh, would, you know, make the usual cries of outrage and then essentially they would find a way back, uh, number one. Number two, there's been a president of the United States, the former president mm -hmm. of the United States, who has praised Putin and created an entire pro-Putin wing of the Republican Party, uh, something I, I never thought I would utter in my lifetime, how, you know, the, the Republican Party went from being the party of Mitt Romney and, you know, Russia is the greatest geopolitical Great threat we Russia. face uh, within a few years to literally having a man who praised the invasion of Ukraine as genius, genius, and is not a faction of one, despite the efforts after the fact to kind of rewrite history, but is the leader of a large chunk of the Republican Party has been apologizing for Vladimir Putin and going along with Donald Trump blackmailing the exact same people uh, that now the whole world says, oh my goodness, we love those Ukrainians. Well, where were these people in 2019? You know, all those people, ask yourself, who have mm -hmm. the blue and yellow icons on their Twitter you know, feed, where were those Republicans in 2019? They were voting to say, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. We're totally able to blackmail Vladimir Zelensky, who we now say is Churchill in our time. It's a little bit of um, revisionist history. So let, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the role that Donald Trump uh, played and, and what he's saying right now, as well as the role that China might play in this war. Let's do this right after this. Homeowners who haven't taken advantage of today's low interest rates are overpaying their mortgage. Make sure this isn't you. It just takes a 10-minute call to American Financing, America's home for home loans, where you'll get a free no-obligation mortgage review from a salary-based mortgage consultant, so there's no pressure. 
And you're not paying any upfront or hidden fees. You're just learning about the different ways you can save up to $1,000 a month. That's right, a month. Think of what you can do with that kind of money. The kind of difference it can make on your budget. Then make the call to American Financing to learn more and do it now before rates rise. You could end up skipping up to two payments and may close in as fast as 10 days. Call 888-991-9788. That's 888-991-9788. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net and tell them Charlie Sykes sent you. NMLS 182334 nmlscustomeraccess.org. Okay, we are back with Susan Glasser, staff writer at The New Yorker and CNN Global Affairs Analyst and the author of Kremlin Rising, Vladimir Putin's Russia in the End of Revolution. You know, Susan, you were, you were just mentioning the, the role that, uh, that Donald Trump played here. Now, now, Trump and the Republicans are trying to do a little revisionist history saying, well, if you ignore all of the rhetoric, Barack Obama refused to give weapons to Ukraine, but ultimately Ukraine got weapons from Trump. Now, obviously that ignores a great deal, uh, but you know, there's, there's a, there's a long, there is a long history here. So how emboldened was Vladimir Putin by the rhetoric of Trump and Trump's willingness to extort the Ukrainians? How, how emboldened was he by the things that were the basis of impeachment 1.0. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that, uh, you know, I think perhaps Putin and Xi Jinping, they found Trump to be a, a problematic international actor because he is so erratic and unstable in his decision making and they couldn't be certain. And both, you know, dictatorships to a certain extent, you know, have tended to thrive on stability, right? They, they in order. They want to understand, you know, where others are coming from uh, in the world. And and frankly, that's what made Trump in general so dangerous. Uh, you know, you don't want superpowers who are unpredictable. Uh, and Trump, because he was so uninformed and had such an un-American uh, admiration for the most vile kind of dictators, uh, you know, it, it made the U.S. a very problematic superpower during his tenure. And, you know, your point about Russia, you know, the, Trump's personal record is actually crystal clear. There's, there's really no ambiguity, no matter how much the fog machine wants there to be. Donald Trump admired and sucked up to Vladimir Putin for years predating his political campaign. He uh, came into office hoping to have, in fact, a major reorientation of American foreign policy uh, toward favorable dealings with Vladimir Putin. He was stymied uh, both by uh, the remnants of the Republican leadership on Capitol Hill and by members of his own administration through successive waves of Trump's own purges uh, who resisted him, including, by the way, Mike Pompeo, who now you know wants to have it both ways, but in fact privately was right there along with John Bolton trying to stop Donald Trump from blackmailing Ukraine and withholding $400 million worth of desperately needed assistance to the Ukrainians. Pompeo, Bolton, they tried to stop him. They couldn't. It was only the imminent threat of investigation that finally got him to lift that hold. The record is crystal clear on that. And, and you don't even need to look any farther than Donald Trump actually cheerleading this deadly, awful war as it was beginning and calling it genius on the part of Vladimir Putin. Trump didn't support his own government's policy when it came to Russia. So there was this inherent waves of conflict and tension inside the administration over that. But again, the, the record itself is actually very clear. And and, and what would Trump 2.0 look like? What would a second Trump term be? Because I saw that you tweeted out in a different context that a second Trump term would be quite a bit different than the first Trump term. Now, well, now that I, he knows what he can do and he get, gets rid of, you know, folks like, uh, you know, like, like Bolton and even Pompeo. Absolutely. I think that, you know, look at what Trump did at the Pentagon after he was defeated in the yes. 2020 election. And you begin to see the kind of authoritarian cult of personality type organization of the government. I thought it was uh, very revealing and worrisome to listen to Trump at his rally just the other day. Yeah. And that was the context for that tweet, mm -hmm. you know, talking about how we have to basically make it so that I can fire Everyone. the entire, 
executive branch of the government that, you know, nobody, we should have no professional civil service, basically, in the view of Donald Trump, and he should be allowed to bring in essentially his sort of personal guard of MAGA loyalists, not even Republican loyalists, but, you know, those who express personal loyalty just to the leader. And, you know, Trump is fundamentally, it seems to me, opposed to many aspects of our constitutional system and has identified weaknesses in that system, testing and probing over the four years of his term in office. And I think that, you know, he would be much more focused on having a different kind of subservient loyalty. You know, I'm working on this history right now of the four years of the Trump administration Mm -hmm. with my husband, Peter Baker. And one of the things when you, this is sort of the first crack at a real four-year book of Trump in the White House. And when you see how over time, right, even the most kind of dysfunctional, like uninformed, you know, kind of organization, it learns over time. And Again and again, Trump was purging those who didn't tell him what he wanted to hear, purging those who resisted his plans. And the great tragedies of 2020 and the end of his tenure were enabled by that and by the fact that, you know, it's inconceivable as flawed of a person as John Kelly was. If John Kelly was chief of staff of the White House on January 6, 2021, you know, does anyone think that it would have played out the same way? No, of course it wouldn't have. Uh, and so Trump coming back to the White House would be a very different and I think much more dangerous character than what the one who he, was yeah. dangerous enough in the first four years. What would he do with NATO? Because right now we're seeing a revival of the of, of NATO and of the Western alliance. What would a second Trump term be? Because there had been reports, there had been speculation that Trump had told people, I don't know what speculation, that Trump had told people that in a second term, he would pull the United States out of NATO. What do you think? Yeah, well, it's, you know, John Bolton has reported that yeah. publicly, among others. Our reporting suggests that Trump was much more serious about withdrawing from NATO than was previously understood, mm-hmm. starting okay. from the beginning of his tenure. Uh, and uh, that it was, you know, repeated efforts as opposed to just idle comments, but really, you know, a focus of his and Bolton has has said that he believes that that would have been something Trump would have tried to do. Now, right now, we're in the middle of a momentous shift in the international situation as a result of Putin's war in Ukraine, and NATO is going to be in a very different place by the time of the next American presidential election than it was at the time of the last presidential election. So it's very hard to speculate because right now we are literally in in events that are going to determine, I think, the future course of European security. So it's it's hard to say, you know, what what Trump or any official would do coming into office after 2024, because I think, you know, those facts are being written on the ground right now. So I'm going to double back on on this whole issue of uh, propaganda, but I did want to ask you about all of this. So so Vladimir Putin you know, looks at Donald Trump and he sees uh, Donald Trump as the leader of kind of a pro-Putin wing of the Republican Party. And he begins to see the country that the United States is politically divided. What role does it play that you have somebody like Tucker Carlson, who is on the air, basically pushing the Russian line and the fact that Russian state TV has decided that he's the go-to guy. So at some point, does Vladimir Putin or, or his circle, do they start to believe their own propaganda and they're watching and they're saying, this is Fox News, the most watched news station in America. They may imagine that. And look, look what the Americans are thinking. Does I mean, to what extent does that embolden Trump's or, or Putin's circle? I mean, I understand that Putin is not a man of too many illusions, but what do you what do you think? That's got to play a role. <laughs> Well, of course it does. Look, I mean, you know, this is right out of the Soviet playbook. I mean, there's nothing truly new under the sun, right? I mean, there always were useful idiots uh, uh, advancing Stalin's propaganda, even at the height of the purges and and show trials in Moscow. And so Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump count them out of a long tradition of Western apologists for uh, Russian dictators. So it's not, you know, something extraordinarily new. I don't think that Putin is a man of great illusions, as you said. I I think that he took the measure of these people and he's not getting counsel from them. Uh, He's using them. Okay. So let's talk about China. 
this weekend you were on CNN and you called this development that Rus uh, Russia reportedly was asking China for military and financial assistance uh, a, a very significant development. So as of today, do you think I – mean, what, is, what is the state of play? Are the Chinese um, going to help bail out Vladimir Putin? Do they want to be part of this, this shit show? Well, look, they are a part of this shit show. I mean, that's the bottom line. And, you know, Putin and Xi Jinping for the last few years have been growing closer and closer. They've they've literally had dozens of meetings and conversations with each other, culminating uh, in an in in-person meeting, a first for both of them during COVID uh, on the eve of the Beijing Olympics and right before this invasion. There is no scenario in which Vladimir Putin did not inform Xi Jinping in advance that he was planning to undertake this special military operation in Ukraine. Uh, now, of course, we can't know and don't know how honest was Putin about the nature of uh, the conflict he was about to unleash. But certainly, if Xi Jinping didn't understand that an army of 200,000 Russians on the border of Ukraine was about to invade in a deadly war, then he probably should be firing his entire intelligence staff. So I think that, you know, China was not only well aware of what was about to transpire, but made a decision to have this in-person meeting and to sign a 5,000 word mm -hmm. document that is a remarkable document, basically, of, you know, strategic alignment between Russia and China, pulling them officially closer to each other than at any time in decades since the great Soviet-Chinese split many, many years ago in the Cold War. And so, you know, China now faces this choice, right? It hasn't, the war hasn't gone as Putin hoped. It didn't result in a lightning, you know, blitzkrieg taking of the capital and decapitation of the Zelensky government. So, you know, now uh, both of them see the world reacting and pushing back in a very strong way that has potential negative, very serious negative economic consequences for China. So the flip side is Xi's credibility and his long-term planning about a world in which there is this sort of new axis of authoritarians is challenged. If he just abandons Putin just, you know, weeks after announcing this alignment, that's a problem for him too. So I think China is in a very awkward and difficult situation right now. But I don't think that they're surprised per se. <laughs> you know, they knew that this invasion was happening and they are absolutely in bed with Russia. So what do you make of the seven hour meeting between the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and his Chinese counterpart in Rome yesterday? Yeah, I, that's very significant. And I'm glad you brought that up because, look, you know, China uh, uh, doesn't have the same recent experience with use of force and, and military power that Putin does. You know, Putin has always, from the beginning of his rule of Russia, accompanied that with uh, acts of great violence and terrorism and murder and war, whereas China has not had a war since 1979 when it invaded Vietnam and really got a, a black eye as a result of it. So, you know, China has preferred to develop in a very different way than Russia. I think it has sort of looked down actually on Russia to a certain extent and, and seen that, you know, they still have managed to reinvent Chinese communism for the 21st century to be this economic powerhouse to, you know, grow the country. And they look and they see, Gorbachev and the collapse of the Soviet Union, a story of a series of failures. And so I don't think that the Chinese are eager, you know, to be sucked into the yeah. Russian way of operating on the world stage. There's no question about that. Uh, they see themselves as being much more strategic, smarter, um, perhaps less barbaric. Uh, so it's, again, it's, it's a... Is there leverage there for the Americans? It's very smart, it seems to me, for Jake Sullivan to be you know, trying to make clear also some of the consequences. There's a huge fear right now, Charlie, of Putin in a corner and the kinds of escalation he might undertake. That's exactly where I wanted to go next, okay? Because you've raised the history of, of what he's done in the past, Grozny and Aleppo. And and again, this is sort of the dark side of this, <laughs> this discussion here. Your point this morning that, you know, we've seen these horrors in Ukraine, but you think we're not prepared for how horrible it can become because a lot of people averted their eyes from what, what he has already done, what Vladimir Putin has done in places like Aleppo and, and, uh, and in Grozny. 
Well, that's part of it. But the other part is even scarier at the risk of putting my full Cassandra hat on, which is to say Putin's history suggests that when backed into a corner, he escalates. And I don't just mean bombardment of civilian facilities and infrastructure and, and apartment buildings, but you know, there's a real specter right now, for example, of possible chemical weapons use. Uh, there have been efforts in the kind of Russian propaganda to begin laying the pretext where they would blame something like that on the, the Ukrainians as a, as a rationale, perhaps, for their military escalation, uh, uh, a way uh, to force the Ukrainians and NATO, and the United States, uh, to the table on different terms. Uh, especially if their other military objectives aren't going well. Again, it's not theoretical. Putin has used banned weapons before. You pointed out about the use of the radioactive polonium to uh, attempt to assassinate a regime opponent in London, justifying chemical weapons used by the Assad regime. So, you know, that is a great fear because it's not clear what the West, what the Biden administration will do in that situation. We've already you know, gone very, very high up the ladder with our sanctions. There's not that much more we can do economically to Russia. And the public pressure, which is already enormous to do more, people are horrified by what they're seeing. Imagine what that would be like in a case of an actual chemical weapons attack. The the, the pressure to take a military kinetic response to chemical weapons used by Putin, I think would be overwhelming on the Biden administration. And so you begin to get very quickly into these kind of nightmarish scenarios of rising tensions and NATO being drawn directly into conflict. So you, you, you said before that that Putin is, is likely to try to wait out this, this moment, this temporary moment of unity in the West here, betting on our weakness. Um, you know, that, that's why the invasion happened in the first place. What is what is your evaluation of, of Biden's handling of this, including whether or not he has done enough to deter that kind of escalation? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I've been struck certainly at the clear eyedness that Biden and his team seem to have in the run up to the war. You know, lots of pushback, frankly, across the political spectrum from left and right who just didn't believe their own eyes, refused to believe credible American intelligence reports uh, who persisted, you know, you saw it in a number of the other Western leaders, you know, who persisted in the kind of delusion that Vladimir Putin was negotiating when in fact he was never serious about diplomacy in the run-up to the war. But, you know, you had Macron literally, you know, on the Sunday night before the war being like, oh, well, you know, I've negotiated a, a meeting between Putin and Biden that was, of course, never going to happen. And so, you know, Biden didn't fall prey to that, uh, very different in some ways than the kind of lack of reality based thinking about the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the true state of the Afghan government. You know, in contrast to that, I think they were very clear eyed about Putin. They didn't get played by him diplomatically. They had this very novel strategy of putting out intelligence almost in real time, you know, to prepare the world for what was coming. Uh, but of course, they didn't prevent the invasion from happening and had limited tools, I think. And that's what it shows, right? That Putin was almost immune from, from yeah. negotiating. And I think that's unfortunately still where we are. I don't see any meaningful prospects for diplomacy today mm -hmm. that, you know, didn't really exist a week ago. Uh, it doesn't mean there won't be. It's certainly important to keep talking, especially as the horrors of this war unfold. You know, absolutely bring it on, even if it's hopeless, uh, is my view about diplomacy. But I don't think we should be deluding ourselves. So where do Republicans go on all of this? At the moment, they, um, at least public opinion polls would show that Republicans uh, are, you know, supportive of the sanctions. Uh, they are, you know, supportive of what's going on in Ukraine. But I don't see any um, willingness to break with Donald Trump over this particular issue. In fact, they seem to be more um, enthusiastic about coalescing around pointing at and, and blaming Biden's weakness for all of this. What do you think? Does this shift yeah, anything? Does this change anything? Well, you know, it is interesting. On the one hand, right, you want to say, OK, well, uh, at a time of such deep division here in the U.S., it's certainly better than the alternative that you have large overwhelming majorities in Democrats and Republicans voting for $14 billion worth of, uh, you know, aid and assistance to Ukraine. You have a bipartisan applause for Biden in that yeah. part of his yeah. State of the Union speech. You have public opinion polls, 
you know, strongly, of course, you know, being horrified at what's happening and, and supportive of Ukraine. But it seems to me that that the Republicans are still hoping that that kind of Donald Trump era playbook works for them of right. basically right. just picking and choosing, ignoring the fact that the leader of their party, who they continue to follow, has praised Putin's war as genius and simply pretending that mm -hmm. those aspects of Trump that they find uncomfortable don't exist and thinking that voters are so stupid that they will somehow be perfectly fine with that fiction. And so, you know, it's a deeply cynical approach, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not an effective one politically. It is interesting that this has become an issue in some of the Republican primaries, though, uh, that, that, that you are seeing, for example, you know, Congressman Tom Rice of South Carolina has been targeted by Trump. He actually is, you know, is, is using, you know, Trump's comments about Ukraine against him. So I think that'll be an interesting indicator how these things play in Republican primaries, because isolationism is no longer the the strong card that it used to be in Republican politics, or, or at least, you know, it may not be. We'll see. Well, it may not be, right, first of all. Second of all, Americans really tend not to vote on the basis of foreign policy. At the beginning, you know, of this conflict, you know, it literally was, I, I think I, you know, spoke with a Republican pollster said it was like under 1% <laughs> of voters, Democrat or Republican, who thought foreign policy was the biggest issue. Now, of course, the world's attention has been transfixed by this, but- yeah. You know, we Americans are a, a surface people at this point when it comes to world affairs. And, um, you know, it's uh, the, all these people with their their blue and yellow flags. What do they really know or care, sadly, about Ukraine or about Russia or about the, the consequences to the United States? Uh, I think that if Republicans, many of them are making a cynical calculation that they'll just be able to get away with having mm -hmm. enabled Trump's blackmail of the same Ukrainians that they... Uh, claim to support right now. Susan Glasser, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and uh, spending that time with us on the Bulwark podcast today. Thank you, Charlie, for, uh, for having me back and uh, to all your great listeners. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again. Hey, it's Rich Eisen, and my first guest of season three of Just Getting Started happens to be the new host of this podcast, my better half, Susie Schuster. You've got one of the most unique stories of how you got started, so why don't you come across the hall, take the chair, and... Oh, boy, wait a minute. I think I, I locked the door. That's not a metaphor for anything. How's the lighting in here? I mean, I'm vain, you know? So I thought for the first season try to bring you people I thought were diverse and different and maybe interesting and that's why I started off with Jeffrey Ross the comedian and then you know we've got a bunch of other asks out making Paul Rudd do it sorry Paul do you know that you're doing it and I want this to be inspirational life is really hard right now and sometimes you just need a little bit of help someone to reach out their hand and pull you along or to push you from behind and say you can do this and I'm hoping that's what you're going to get from just getting started go follow just getting started wherever you get your favorite shows